let's see if this works. All right. Good. Good. Yep. Good. Cool. So, so you came up with the concept of the idea maze, right? Which I think is especially important in the blockchain world because there's so many ideas happening so quickly and so much to learn. Uh, so why don't you take us down your own kind of personal idea maze in this space that's led you kind of to where you are now with earn.com? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, the idea maze for, you know, those of you who aren't familiar with the concept. So the basic uh, concept is you might have uh, a business plan like, hey, let's do music on the internet. But there's many permutations of that. Are you doing it, you know, like a Napster kind of thing? Are you trying to do it like a Spotify type of thing? Are you doing it like a YouTube type of thing where you're doing music videos, not just music? And um, the various permutations, some of them lead to failure modes and others lead to, you know, large exits like in the case of YouTube. And it's not completely obvious at the beginning. You know, you might have a broad concept of, you know, let's do music, but the details really do matter. And some doors, you know, open and some don't. Um, over the last couple of years, prior to uh, the rise of Ethereum and, and the whole token space, the main things that worked in crypto were A, Chinese mining, and B, exchanges. Um, and now we've got a larger set of things that, that are starting to, starting to work. Um, but that's kind of like the history. And of course, just holding, you know, Bitcoin itself up, up until early, you know, this year and holding Ethereum. Um, so now it's now possible for those folks who've been working on applications or had application ideas for a while uh, to actually, you know, make those things work, uh, which brings us to what we're doing with, with Earn.com. Um, so, you know, now, you know, we, we've got pretty good traction. We're growing uh, quickly. And, uh, you know, the idea is that you can now uh, get digital currency by replying to emails, completing tasks. And if this gets to very large scale, then the idea is that, you know, first you mined Bitcoin and you earned it for computation. Um, and then you bought tokens uh, for capital. And now you can earn digital currency for labor. So it's like a third way of issuance. And actually, you had a kind of a quote on this like a year and a half ago or something, which I thought was good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we, I, mean, we, I mentioned at the start, kind of we all have our own personal bias. I'm definitely biased to this product um, as a user, but also as someone who's just thought that there's kind of a certain segment of people in the world that want to buy and sell digital currencies, but perhaps an even broader segment of people kind of globally that want to earn. And so you've kind of had this product, right, um, for about a year now with, with just Bitcoin, and now you're tokenizing. Um, yeah. So talk a little bit about that, and specifically, I think, like, you know, why tokenize? I think a lot of people in the room, possibly, and even myself, for a while, uh, thought it was just about Bitcoin, right? right? And didn't necessarily see a world where uh, there's thousands of potential tokens, uh, but it's becoming inc increasingly clear that uh, we may see a world like that. But why, specifically for for your product, do you sure. think? Yeah. So me, why for us, and then why for kind of the yeah. general. So, um, so we actually, if you go to earn.com front slash token, you can kind of look at the white paper. It's up there. It's about 70 pages. So um, you'll finish it in a few minutes. Um, but um, basically, uh, we're not doing an ICO, so we're not selling you know tokens to the public for for capital. Um, instead, what we're doing is uh, we are, rather than distributing tokens for capital, we're distributing them for labor. So by signing up, by getting verified, by completing tasks, by onboarding others, by referring senders of tasks to the network, um, we issue you tokens for doing those things. And as the network grows in scale, uh, you're now a stakeholder in the network. And um, you know this is sort of similar to you know people who said, hey, what if Facebook could have given half of its value to its users? Uh, you know that would have been quite a lot of money that that it would have given to folks. Um, and you know technically it wasn't possible to do that for many years because you had international users, you had you had difficulties associated with that. Uh, but if what we're doing works, it'll then be a new way to bootstrap and scale uh, social networks in two-sided marketplaces. Um, and so then that's a use case for tokens, which is not raising capital, but actually customer and you know sender acquisition which is which is interesting um, so that's what we're doing with you know the earnable token and that's what we call it, the earnable token because it's earnable um, and uh, then more generally uh, you know in terms of the the space at large yes for a long time you know folks you know Brian Armstrong myself others were basically very um, you know like very pro Bitcoin we're still pro Bitcoin but I think it was really around uh, late 2015, early 2016, when it became clear that the scaling issue was not just like a few months kind of thing, but um, that uh, it, 
it represented a deep philosophical split that uh, was going to endure for some time. And I think what that did was it basically, you know, roughly resulted in one coin, one application, right? So I think Bitcoin is a lock, is a digital gold. Um, in, in an interesting sense, actually, the fee issue may contribute to that because the more Bitcoin that becomes unspendable, so something like 57% of balances are unspendable in Bitcoin because the fees are too high, or, or I've seen a stat on that. Um, and you know that varies because fees go up and down, and so there's periods where those balances might actually be spendable. But let's say there's some percentage that's unspendable. Paradoxically, that takes supply off the marketplace um, and actually increases the price. Um, and so for those folks who are you know like into Bitcoin as a as a digital gold, that's good. Another thing it does is it discourages uh, you from just sending a transaction um, in in a short period of time. And said you really want to think about whether you want to do a Bitcoin transaction, and then you time it you know four days in advance or or what have you, and and you, you wouldn't want to do it in a just in time fashion. So then that means you've got a very you know. Uh, high time preference, right? You, you can, you're willing to send it only after a lot of judiciousness, a lot of consideration, not right now. So it discourages impulse, uh, you know, purchases. For those reasons, Bitcoin becomes a lock as digital gold, but other applications move to other coins. And you, I think you've, before you've had some pretty provocative thoughts on kind of China and particularly Chinese mining and that kind of impacting, um, you know, like other coins, other consensus mechanisms, things like that. W what are some thoughts there? And has, has that kind of impacted your decision to kind of move a bit away from Bitcoin for for Earn.com. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, so I took over the company in mid 2015, and around that time, uh, you know, Chinese mining was um, you know really really uh, scaling. And you know, I have a lot of respect for what they did over there. It's economically possible to do things in China that are basically not possible in other other countries. Um, and uh, you know, I think that actually, uh, you know, the demonization of, of some of them is, is, you know, has gone way overboard. I don't think like Jihan is a bad person or anything like that. Um, I don't think the blockstream guys are bad either, for what that's worth. Um, but um, with respect to the the Chinese mining situation, just due to the fact that there's certain economic factors that you know make them, you know, basically the the world beaters. Um, you have concentrated a lot of mining power in basically one country, and that country, you know, China has shown a willingness to go and shut off protocols and shut off applications. Like Facebook is blocked in China, and you know Google is blocked in China, and they have the sophistication, the sophistication and they have the will at the firewall level to go and interdict packets and, and so on. And they've got this doctrine of so-called internet sovereignty, which says uh, anything you view on the internet within China is ultimately subject to, to their jurisdiction. Every packet that crosses their borders is like a physical packet that crosses their borders. They assert the right to like a customs agency interdict that. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, especially given the shutdown of all Bitcoin and, you know, token exchanges in China this year, um, it's quite possible, maybe even likely, that at some point they're going to go and mess with, with mining there, right? Um, that could mean nationalizing it. It could mean acquiring the miners. It could mean, you know, directing them to do malicious mining. Uh, it could mean many different kinds of things. Um, but I do think that's one of the probably top three vulnerabilities I think of for the space. Um, now. Uh, you know, it's possible for them maybe to open up mining overseas, but that's something that's a large capital investment. It's not flexible. That brings us to things like proof of stake. If yeah. you jump into that. Yeah, yeah. So, what are your thoughts on kind of Ethereum proof of stake? And it's an interesting uh, kind of topic because you know what I found, as I'm sure you have, is kind of in the early days of Ethereum, a lot of the smartest distributed systems PhDs in the world, as well as a lot of the kind of diehard uh, Bitcoin developers, thought that proof of stake basically wasn't possible. Right, um, but there's been a lot of progress on Casper on Ethereum and you know Tendermint and some other uh, proof of stake systems, and especially in a world where you know uh, proof of work mining is potentially dominated by certain countries, it seems an opportunity could be opened up for for proof of stake. So, what are your thoughts? There? Yeah, so so um, I had a write up like a few months ago on uh, uh, quantifying decentralization. And the idea is that you know when people talk about whether a system is decentralized, there's different subsystems um, that they look at. So for example, with Bitcoin you, or, or Ethereum, you can look at uh, okay, how many miners are there? How many different countries are they in? Um, you know, how many exchanges are there? How many different countries are the exchanges in? How many you know wallets are there and nodes and, and so on and so forth? And often what you'll see is people rhetorically, you know, I've got examples of these. They'll say, oh, it's not decentralized because um, you know mining's only in one country or 
Ethereum is not decentralized because you know Vitalik basically controls it, or X or Y. And so, in a sense, like if any subsystem is centralized, that's a choke point, and then the system becomes centralized. And I don't think it's a coincidence that if if you look within Bitcoin, the two arguably, you know, at least by this metric, um, you know, the this uh, modified Gini coefficient kind of thing that that I, that I published, um, at least by that metric or, or things that are related to it. The two most centralized systems in Bitcoin are the ones that have been going to war with each other, the, the core developers and the miners, right? So, you know, it would be hard for, you know, nodes or for holders to go to war with each other because it would just be a melee of everybody shooting at each other and no one knows who each other is, right? So you can only even have that conflict if you've got, you know, centralized kinds of, kinds of pieces. Um, but with proof of stake, what's interesting about that is rather than having all the decision making concentrated geographically in one place, it's distributed throughout the world. That's the advantage of it. The disadvantage of it is, um, you know, there's the whole stake grinding thing, which you know, folks are uh, like who are working on Casper. I've been working on, um, and there's also the fact that, unlike proof of work, to my knowledge, uh, there isn't an algorithm you can just apply to a proof of stake chain that will say, okay, this is you know the longest you know uh, proof of work chain in the absence of reference to a third party. Um, and by that, what I mean is you can actually download the Bitcoin blockchain and you can look at every block and you can calculate roughly how much hashing went into that. And that gives you an absolute ruler in terms of the difficulty you know, embedded in the chain. Whereas if each block is approved by um, just a certain number of holders, there's no external computational metric. There's no external ruler that you can apply. Um, so that means potentially there's vectors where it could be more subject to attack. So I don't argue that one is better than the other in all cases. I'd say that for this kind of attack, like a nation state based attack, proof of stake may be better. For another kind of attack, proof of stake may be worse. And I'm, I'm happy to see different kinds of approaches being applied. Got it. So maybe moving back to earn.com and specifically the earnable token. Uh, so you're launching this as an ERC20 token, is yeah. that right? Right. And maybe talk a little bit about um, you know how you're driving usage of the product or, or driving kind of uh, distributing tokens to drive usage of the product, right? Because as you mentioned, like this is not an ICO. Right. I think most um, people in the ecosystem that are launching new projects right now are kind of optimizing for the, all this interest in tokens by raising a lot of a lot of cash, right? And uh, you know, Bitcoin didn't raise cash, right? Bitcoin kind of launched uh, a, a system and had an incentives kind of mechanism and distributed coins and bootstrapped it that way. And so maybe talk a little bit about exactly how you're, you're doing yeah. that and some of the things you're thinking about. So, you know, like, you know, raising capital, it, it's not a bad thing. You know, Ethereum did, you know, the first ICO, they raised 25. At the time, it was considered an enormous amount of money and, and whatnot, and they did very, very well with that. Um, but uh, what we're doing is something where uh, it, it's been talked about a lot, but I don't think people have actually implemented it to my knowledge, which is um, every time the user base of earn.com doubles, the token reward halves. Okay, so what that means is that you have a strong incentive to just go and sign up immediately and get your earnable tokens because in the event that the thing actually works uh, and we double many times, you will have a very large stake in the network relative to folks who are later on. Um, it's as if, you know, for example, if you take uh, Facebook, uh, you know, if Facebook had split its, you know, equity with, uh, you know, all of its uh, users, then that'd be 2 billion users, 250 billion, you know, divided among 2 billion users, $125 for every man, woman, and child on Facebook. But in practice, it wouldn't have split it equally. It would have wanted to have given the first 10,000 and 100,000 and million and 10 million people more <laughs> than the billionth user uh, because these folks contributed more to the network effect. And now, you know, tokens aren't equity, but um, what, what this does, though, is when you're building up a network, you can actually allow people to get a piece of it early on, um, not in exchange for capital, but in exchange for labor, such that uh, if the thing becomes a, of a large size, then just by clicking a few buttons early in you know, 2018 or late in 2017, um, they've got something that's of, of great utility in the future. So do you think we're going to see in 2018 uh, more uh, thinking about kind of this approach as opposed to the massive kind of cash grab up front to, to fund product yeah. development? So I think, um, I mean, uh, if you take the pie chart for token distribution, um, if what we're doing works, uh, and, you know, we'll probably know that by like, you know, late Q1 or Q2 or thereabouts. Um, the, uh, so right now the, the system is based on Bitcoin. You can go and sign up for it. Um, and uh, we're going to flip a switch, and we're already having people in the beta uh, to, to flip you over to, to tokens, so you can mess around with that. Um, and you'll be grandfathered, so depending on the order in which you sign up, then you, you go and get your, your tokens. Um, so we'll know if it works probably by you know, mid-next year. We'll, we'll, we'll be able to see it. And I think if you take the pie chart of 
any given token, you've got 100% at the beginning. And people, I think, will allocate some fraction of it for, you know, like selling, you know, in an ICO, some fraction for maybe an airdrop, some fraction for an earn.com style bootstrapping, and so on and so forth, right? So each of these are new ways of kind of using, like, the pool uh, in, in addition to the traditional ways of, you know, like, um, like allowing it to be mined or what have you. Mm -hmm. Got it. And I, in terms of how the products are being used right now, um, you know, like what are some use cases? I, email's the obvious one. Um, list. Maybe talk a little bit about kind of. You've got you know lots of users sure. right now and yeah. lots of traction. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So you know, if, if you're if you see us on Twitter, a lot of folks you know tweeting about how they've been making making money. Um, and uh, the fundamental, so uh, you know, kinds of pitches or, or things you'll see on there. So for users, um, you know, they have wanted to. One of the most popular queries. Uh, for a long time has been, you know, make money online, but there have been, you know, very sketchy sites that allow that, but it's a, it's an eternal human desire to make money online, right? Um, for senders, actually, many companies want to send mass cold emails, and if you Google the term, like, buy email lists, um, that's a very popular desire as well. Um, but, you know, people usually don't want their emails sold uh, because they don't get, you know, any cut of that, and there's no consent associated with that. So if you put those two desires together, make money online and buy email lists, you actually have a match made in heaven where um, you're, you're selling something that is not that um, you know, dear to you, right? Um, you're basically selling a minute or so of your time, but it's extremely valuable to the person on their side. So the kinds of you know, groups that are using it, so certainly lots of tokens. Um, so uh, you know, I don't know, close to a billion dollars worth of you know, tokens uh, have uh, sent out messages, blasted folks on our list because we've got lots of crypto people. So that's a major application. Um, folks doing market research, so large consulting firms and you know uh, advisory firms that you've heard of um, send out things to go uh, and talk to 500 biotech executives and then pull that and turn that into a report that they can then go and resell, right? Mm -hmm. And they get response in 24 hours. Uh, or if you're a salesperson, you go and you blast out to 1,000 engineers and you say, hey, are you using containers in production? Um, and let's say, I don't know, 170 of them say yes. You then retarget them with a specific you know, request for an appointment or something like that. So that gives you some of the examples. Basically, you can send an email that includes like a survey or a task, get people to complete that, and then retarget based on that. So it allows some interesting kinds of things. Got it. OK, so last question. We've got a few minutes left. Um, you know, one kind of uh, thing people might say about this type of token approach is, well, you know, it's centralized, right? It's not really decentralized. Um, and I know you, you have some thoughts there on kind of how, how you're building towards decentralization over time. So how do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think that trying to jump immediately towards full decentralization is, is challenging. You have to do uh, what I think of as progressive decentralization. Um, and so, for example, even... Uh, you know, like uh, Ethereum uh, last year with the DAO, there there are issues with being fully decentralized. They needed to actually make a change, and the fact that the system was centralized enough to make allow them to make that change allow that to happen. Similarly, in the early days of Bitcoin, there were many kinds of hard forky type things. There's a bug that allowed people to coin a lot of Bitcoin, and because it was basically a small group of developers, they could effectively push a change through. So I think in the early days of a system, it's relatively hard for it to be fully decentralized from the beginning because you know, decentralized would mean immutable, and immutable means you can never adapt it or change it. Um, with that said, you know, what, what our plan is for decentralizing over time is um, one of the tasks when, you, when you're blasting, uh, you know, these emails or tasks to users, one of the tasks you can send is a pay to install type task, right? So if you've got a mobile application, you can get tens, hundreds of thousands of installations by just clicking a button and blasting out to lots of earn.com users and asking them to, hey, install your you know, uh, iOS app and install your Android app. And um, the thing about that is it's very similar to a very successful ad format that's run on Facebook for a long time, which is paid to install the app, with one critical difference, which is the person on their side gets paid to install it, right? Not, not just Facebook. So the reason that's related to decentralization is Every time pay to install is run, um, you know those that fraction of users. Let's say forty thousand users say yes to that. You've just now effectively copied forty thousand users out of the database into your own database, right? So which partially federates the database, right? And uh, you can replicate that where it's not just pay to install, but like a paid OAuth, where again, out of let's say 100,000 people, 30,000 will grant you permissions. And you can blast them with a task that says, hey, uh, can you try out my app and grant me these permissions to your data, right? So um, by doing something like that, any developer with sufficient capital and consent can then just get hundreds of thousands of users just by sending out tasks at, at earn.com. And that will federate 
the database. And then over time, we might be able to move to something which is fully decentralized, like potentially like an IPFS or Filecoin uh, type, you know, uh, relational um, type data store on top of which we have a relational database. Uh, but one thing I would just say is that it's not that easy to decentralize a user database as opposed to a transaction database. Bitcoin and Ethereum are both transaction databases. User databases are different, qualitatively different. So got it. Okay. Yeah. That was fun. Thanks. Okay.